All right, now into gastrulation. This is where we're going to spend a lot of time as well as in access specification. Here's where we really start getting down to the dynamics of how things form. In fact, most of the rest of the semester will be on these two. When we start talking about neural development, we'll talk about how gastrulation forms the brain and the spinal column. And we'll talk about how the muscles and the bones form through gastrulation. As we're talking about gastrulation of the, neuro, of the brain and the spinal cord, we'll also talk about the genes involved in specifying those cells to become, you know, the trigeminal nerve and, and uh, you know, the various uh, vestibular cochlear and all these other types of nerve bundles and fibers. So these play uh, a role hand in hand for pretty much the rest of the semester, minus the last two lectures where we're going to talk about um, uh, medicinal. And then what are some of the dynamics regarding, um, you know, the genes and the, the signal transduction pathways, those are going to go hand in hand in each one of these uh, development of the organ systems that we, we talk about. So this is just going to give you a prelude to pretty much the rest of the semester, these two, which is why we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this. Now, the first thing we have to know about gastrulation is invertebrate gastrulation, they pretty much have some of the same things in common. One thing that has to happen in all vertebrate gastrulation is in the initial setting up of the oocyte, you have the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Well, the endoderm and the mesoderm have to be internalized. So some of the first movements of gastrulation in any of these organisms is the internalization of the, these two germ layers, the mesoderm and the endoderm. They start off initially on the outside, but they eventually have to end up on the inside. So that's one of the things that will show in each one of these modes of gastrulation is how do they internalize cells to become the mesoderm and the endoderm, even though fate maps have shown that, you know, for example, for this frog, the fate maps show that the ectoderm, and then this will become mesoderm, these regions right here, well, mostly over here, but this region will eventually become the mesoderm, and then the endoderm will be completely enveloped by the ectoderm. So the ectoderm will form the outer layer, the mesoderm the second, and the endoderm the most internal layer. That's one of the things we'll show in each one of these gastrulation movements. How is that accomplished? Well, pretty much in all cases, you have epiboly. If you remember, epiboly is the movement of cells over another set of cells. So the ectoderm typically undergoes epiboly around the entire embryo. And that's for fish and for frogs and for mammals and for chickens and birds and all that kind of stuff. Another process which it's kind of the same thing as epiboly, but not. It's called convergent extension, where the cells not only are undergoing movements, but they're also undergoing mitotic divisions. And so what you'll see is that as the cells become internalized, you'll start to see multiple cells increasing. And, and so it'll look like there are, uh, it's expanding, which it is, because the cells are accumulating more nutrients and they're undergoing mitotic divisions as epiboly occurs. And eventually, they'll bring a lot of these cells into their various germ layers, the ectoderm on the outside, mesoderm, and then endoderm. And then finally, you'll typically get the first indications of the anterior-posterior axis forming in the earliest stages of the embryo, where it'll start forming the body axis, anterior to posterior, dorsal ventral, left, right. It's easier to see this in organisms like Xenopus and chickens and humans. It's a little bit harder for zebrafish as well as for um, mice. So we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can as we go through here. But these are four kind of movements that are common in all vertebrates. But beyond that, the ways in which they get there, there's a lot of differences. So there is going to be some comparison between the, the model organisms and how they're similar there's also going to be some looking at some of the fundamental differences between each of these. So let's talk about Xenopus gastrulation. Now the gray crescent, if you remember, that's the region that after cortical rotation that you get this tiny gray area. So right there, that gray crescent right there. This is where the first gastrulation movements occur. So right here at this gray crescent, the first thing that happens is there are some cells which we call the bottle cells. 
The reason why they call the bottle cells is because they're kind of oblong in one area and fatter down in the area. They look like a bottle. These bottle cells start the what we call involution process. You remember what involution is? It's where one set of cells will move underneath another sheet of cells. That's one of the gastrulation movements. So right here, this is where the gray crescent occurs. These cells are a group of cells, which we call the bottle cells, that will start involuting and start the initial stages of gastrulation. Now, you can see this right off the bat. This is what we call the dorsal blastopore lip. Here is what's happening right here. Here's an a electron scanning micrograph showing you how these bottle cells will start involuting. This creates the dorsal blastopore lip. These cells will start moving underneath these. Now, the blastocele is right about here, under, underneath all of these cells. So this is going to start moving just right around the blastocele of the embryo. That's one of the reasons why it needs the blastocele, is for these initial movements to give it space for the cells to start moving around. So you can see a side view here. You get these bottle cells. Now, they've shown experimentally that once the involuting occurs, if you remove the bottle cells, gastrulation will still continue. So the bottle cells are really only necessary to start the initial stages of gastrulation. After that, these movements will occur spontaneously from these other cells, even if they remove the bottle cells. Just side note, more really, but um, some scientists said, well, I wonder if these are necessary for a continual movement of these cells you know, through that, and they showed they weren't. Okay, so dorsal blastopore lip. The first cells that enter into start becoming some of the endoderm. So some of the cells that start moving in and upwards, if you look at the fate map here, these are the endoderm. So as these cells are moving up, you can see that you have endoderm forming. The next cells that are coming in uh, form head mesoderm, and the ones after that, cordomesoderm. This is a transient group of tissues that comes from the mesoderm that forms a, a region called the notochord. Now the notochord is a huge signaling center that does a lot of patterning, not only of the nervous system, but also muscle and bone and tendons and things of that sort. They found over time that some of these notochord cells don't just go away. They actually become part of regions of the vertebrae, actually in between the vertebrae, the intervertebral discs. But um, they used to think that the notochord was just there, and then the cells dissolved and went away, and, and they didn't contribute. They're now finding that some of those cells actually do contribute to um, the, the uh, connective tissue between the vertebrae. And then the last thing is the yolk plug, is as these cells are involuting underneath here, then the, the ectoderm starts undergoing epiboly, where it, uh, it undergoes some mitosis, and the, the cells start you know, uh, flattening out. In fact, it starts out really thick, and it eventually gets thinner as well. And the reason why it gets thinner is because the cells are pushing out and forming a much thinner layer. It's almost like taking five lanes of traffic and squeezing them into two. It's much thicker at first, but as you squeeze them into two, it's going to get much, much longer. So that's one of the factors that are involved in here as well, is that the, the ectoderm initially starts out really thick. As it undergoes epiboly, it gets thinner as the cells start pushing around and enveloping the entire mesoderm and endoderm. So that's how this internalizes all of the cells that are mesoderm and endoderm so that the surrounding tissue is just ectoderm and then the mesoderm and the endoderm will start forming the various other parts of the organism. This just kind of shows you some uh, um, actual slides of, of representing the same cartoon pictures you just saw here. Here you can see the blast, dorsal blastopore lip these uh, cells that first come in, you first have some endoderm, and then you have the head mesoderm, and then the corda mesoderm. You still have endoderm here. These cells will involute as the ectoderm will undergo epiboly surrounding it. And here's another illustration showing you how all of the cells will pretty much envelop and finally finish surrounding that yolk plug and then connect together, and then you'll start getting the patterning of the neural tube. So lots and lots of animations or uh, slides here just showing you the same things that have been going over here. In zebrafish gastrulation, uh, one of the first movements is epiboly. So epiboly begins first. 
of these blastoderm cells. And when we say the blastoderm cells, these enveloping layer, the enveloping layer right here um, is what starts be to begin as far as the epiboly that will ultimately surround the yolk. Uh, and the deep cells, this is what uh, eventually will become um, the embryo proper or the actual embryo itself, whereas the enveloping layer doesn't actually become the embryo, but does take place in the gastrulation movements as well as in its specification. Now, one of the first things you have to know is this outer layer of cells, we call it the embryonic shield, just like a shield protects and coats. The embryonic shield is what undergoes epiboly. So as these cells start undergoing convergent extension, remember I explained convergent extension is kind of like taking five rows of cars on a freeway and squishing them down to two. As you move them down to two lanes, it lengthens out. So it goes from a thicker layer to a thinner layer, and that's why these cells are able to move and ultimately envelop all of the yolk area. So you can see that as epiboly occurs over here, you'll also start getting involution of uh, cells that will start moving underneath the sheet of the em embryonic shield. Um, there is a difference here in the gastrulation movements uh, in terms of what becomes what in the germ layers. What I mean by that is I told you in human and in chick gastro, uh, gastrulation, the hypoblast, which is the sheet of cells that forms underneath the epiblast, uh, doesn't become any of the germ layers. Well, that's different in xenopus. In the zebra, or not xenopus, zebrafish. In the zebrafish, the hypoblast does become the mesoderm and the endoderm. So this is different than the others in that the hypoblast actually becomes the, those two germ layers. Whereas in chick and in um, human gastrulation, the hypoblast is necessary for patterning, but it does not become any of the three germ layers. So that's a big difference between them. So here's a side view. Here's the embryonic shield, the enveloping layer, the deep cells that will become the embryo itself, and then epiboly will cause this to ultimately surround that. Here's the yolk syncytial layer. Eventually, these nuclei will be just under the periphery of the embryo as it's developed. So these cells won't really go much deeper into the yolk, but they will still be yolk uh, uh, syncytial nuclei. Let me show you how that is a little bit later on, like this. So you can see how there still are some. And these are necessary for patterning and for induction events as well. Over here, we have the dorsal region and the ventral region. Now, this is determined by maternal components and certain genes we're going to get into later on today um, when we talk in, uh, about axis specification. So here is where you start getting um, the hypoblast starting to form. You can see how the hypoblast will actually form in both of these areas. Um, however, this region right here plays a key role in patterning. Uh, we're going to talk about in just a second what we call the organizer. So just keep that in mind as we talk about this. This dorsal region right here plays a particular um, role. Now the hypoblast, as I mentioned here, does become the mesoderm and the endoderm. The epiblast here, as you can see, will become the ectoderm. So the epiblast here becomes the ectoderm, and the hypoblast becomes the mesoderm and the endoderm. That is completely different than the chick and the human. So we'll show that here in a second as far as the gastrulation. So here we have involuting cells. This is equivalent to, in the xenopus, the dorsal blastopore lip. It does the same types of initial gastrulation movements as it does in the xenopus, where you start getting involution of these cells. And at that same region, you also get the organizer. You'll see how in each one of these models, even though they have some fundamental differences in their modes of you know, in some of their patterning, some of the same processes occur in every single one of them. Um, so, involution of cells, you have the epiblast, these involuting cells will become the hypoblast, and then convergent extension causes these outer cells to essentially extend and undergo epiboly to surround the entire yolk layer. You'll still have some yolk syncytial nuclei that will be just beneath this layer that are necessary for uh, further patterning. So here you start to see the establishment of the various germ layers, the ectoderm on the outside, the mesoderm, and then the endoderm. Most of the hypoblasts will become mesoderm. Endoderm, 
it, it's a little more complex in how it forms, but it does form from the hypoblast, but a good majority of these initial cells that are forming the hypoblast will ultimately end up to be the mesoderm, as you can see here in this layer as it forms. So those are the initial stages of zebrafish gastrulation and setting up of the body plan. Let's talk about chick gastrulation. As we talked about, uh, it forms on top of the yolk. Uh, it is meroblastic. Um, it does form a hypoblast. So first it forms an epiblast, and then it forms a what we call subgerminal cavity through osmosis, where it causes fluid to uh, go between the epiblast and the yolk to form uh, a, a barrier just like the others. Now that's not technically the blastocele yet. Once the hypoblast forms just beneath the epiblast, the layer in between the epiblast and the hypoblast, that's what we call the blastocele, similar to the xenopus blastocele. Um, as we uh, saw previously. Subgerminal cavity, yeah. So the subgerminal cavity is just the fluid-filled area. That's what makes it so that this middle area is a little more translucent, which is why we call it the area pellucida, and the outer area is opaque because the cells don't have any fluid between that layer and the yolk. So, so here is a side view. You've got the epiblast forming uh, on top of this area. Here we've got the subgerminal cavity, so you already got a lot of fluid. Here are cells that are um, uh, confluent or touching the yolk area, so you don't have space in between here. The yolk is just beneath right here. But this region plays a critical role. Now, one of the methods of um, uh, how the hypoblast forms here is it doesn't form necessarily from cells extending out from these cells right here but rather from the epiblast cells will ingress. Actually, we typically call it delamination. If you remember that gastrulation movement, delamination is where one sheet will actually form into two sheets. So these cells will uh, undergo an epithelial to mesenchyme transition. They'll break free from the epiblast. They'll migrate downwards, and they'll form a new layer. So we call it delamination because it forms a new layer or sheet of cells just beneath the other cells. Now the space in between the epiblast and the hypoblast, that is the blastocele. And that is necessary for the gastrulation movements that are going to occur here in just a little bit. So here's a top view looking at the, uh, um, these regions. The top here, uh, looking at the dorsal side or downwards, you're seeing the gray, which is the epiblast. Underneath, you're looking at the hypoblast. So when you're looking underneath at the ventral side, this is just showing how the cells start forming the hypoblast, this sheet of cells just beneath the epiblast itself. Okay. Now, in this situation, the hypoblast does not form mesoderm or endoderm. The epiblast completely forms all three germ layers. The hypoblast, however, is necessary for patterning. That's why one of the biggest processes of today we're going to talk about is axis specification and differentiation of cells and whatnot. So the hypoblast plays a key role in the patterning of the three germ layers, even though the hypoblast itself does not become part of any of the germ layers of the embryo. I'll talk a little bit later on about the primitive streak and, and um, Kohler sickle, but one of the, um, in terms of patterning. But what happens is you're looking at the area pellucida here. In the most posterior region, cells will start to invaginate. Okay, remember, the invagination is just where they start enfolding and forming a groove. Um, this invagination is, again, equivalent to the dorsal blastopore lip in Xenopus, as well as that embryonic shield um, in uh, zebrafish. Now, you don't get involution yet, but you do get invagination. So it starts forming this pit where the cells start kind of forming a little groove. In fact, we call it the primitive streak. Sometimes we call it the primitive groove because it's a tiny invagination. And it extends from the posterior region all the way to the anterior region. So you actually see the groove start moving forward towards the anterior region of the, um, uh, of the area pellucida. And that's going to start forming the axes of the chicken. So eventually, there comes a point where you see this long groove this pit, this invagination of cells. They don't invaginate all at once, but it actually moves forward and the cells move uh, forward to the anterior region 
um, in this as well. You do get some convergent extension where you get elongation. You can see how initially the area pellucida is circular in nature. Eventually it starts extending out, just like you saw with some of the other uh, model organisms. If we look at a fate map, you can see that at this point, we can mostly determine what ectoderm, neural ectoderm, um, as well as uh, various types of mesoderms are going to form. We don't see endoderm yet at this point, but you will see that here soon enough. Um, so the primitive streak plays a key role in the anterior-posterior axis formation. In fact, when you look at it, this also is where left-right patterning starts to come into play. And it, there are various genes that get turned on on the left side that aren't turned on on the right side, and that's what makes the heart on one side and the liver on the other side and so on and so forth. That's what, where it, you get that left-right symmetry. Okay. You can see further elongation uh, of, of the uh, embryo as it undergoes extension. And there are a lot of mitotic events going on here too. We're going to get into some of these things. What I want to illustrate right here is this. Now you start to get um, cells that are involuting. Actually, we would call this ingressing because they do break free and become mesenchyme. But then some of the cells will reform a new epithelial layer uh, that will form the endoderm. So you can see here in the green cells or the hypoblast, what happens is as the cells start ingressing in through the primitive streak or the primitive groove here, they will undergo this transition from epithelial to mesenchyme. Some of the cells will migrate inward to the middle area, and that will become the mesoderm. Other cells will migrate further ventrally, displacing the hypoblast. So these cells will actually push the hypoblast away and form another layer of cells beneath it, and that will become the endoderm. So that's why all three germ layers come from the epiblast. The hypoblast is necessary for initial patterning, but eventually cells from the epiblast will displace the hypoblast and start forming endoderm, and other cells will start forming mesoderm. Now, this is the same way in which humans begin their initial stages of gastrulation. We have this patterning of the epiblast and the hypoblast. The cells will undergo the primitive groove. Cells will start ingressing. They will move in and form mesenchyme in, in the middle here. Again, remember, this is the blastocele, which allows cells to have that ability to move and push things out of the way and migrate and gives it that space necessary. And then the hypoblast gets displaced and, uh, by these um, cells that are ingressing, and this will form a new sheet of cells, uh, which will uh, become the endoderm. Those are the initial stages of gastrulation. Eventually, you start getting the head forming and the tail forming, and this is where the brain's going to form and the spinal column, and we'll get into all those good, that good stuff later. Let's look at human gastrulation, since it's so similar to chick gastrulation. Here, we've got the trophoblast cells that are on the outside. Here's the inner cell mass as it's been patterning during its journey down towards uh, the uterus. Eventually, you form the epiblast, and the hypoblast, identical to what you find in the chick gastrulation. The same thing is true. The hypoblast does not become any of the germ layers. It doesn't become mesoderm or endoderm, but it is also necessary for patterning. This is one of the reasons why using chick gastrulation as a model for human gastrulation teaches us so much about ourselves. If you're looking at a dorsal view, you can see the same movements going on, where the cells will ingress, and a lot of these cells will move forward to form where the head's forming. Here's a, a transverse section looking at it sideways. Again, here's the hypoblast beneath, and as cells ingress, they will form mesoderm and displace the hypoblast to form the endoderm. So all three germ layers, again, come from these epiblast cells. So comparison. Let's compare these models for now. They're actually very similar to one another between chickens and birds and frogs. As we talked about, the blastocele is always between um, uh, typically the ectoderm and the mesoderm and the endoderm. So here in the frog, the xenophis, you have a huge blastocele, which plays an important role in patterning. Over on the top here, you have the ectoderm, and these two layers are going to be the mesoderm and the endoderm. Over here, we find the epiblast and the hypoblast, and in between that, you have the blastocele. Over here in humans, or in mammals in this case, you have um, epiblast, the hypoblast, and then you have the blastocele in between. 
So some of the same movements occur here. In fact, we didn't show epiboly, but epiboly does occur where the ectoderm, what will become the ectoderm, will surround the mesoderm and the endoderm. So at a certain point in gastrulation, as these three germ layers are being set up, this outer layer will completely undergo epiboly and engulf and internalize, as we uh, mentioned before, is one of the processes that happens in all of these gastrulations, internalizes the mesoderm and the endoderm. So epiboly is occurring, but we don't really see it at these initial stages like you do with the Xenopus or with the zebrafish.